Hello. Well, as anyone who watches my channel will know, I cover a lot of audio and video technology. And today we're doing something slightly unusual. It's a DAB radio, brand new from Lidl, cost about £25. Uh, this is intended for use in the kitchen, so it's designed to mount sort of underneath the uh, kitchen unit, and it's even got a light underneath. But I'm not planning on using it for that. I want to use it uh, as a tuner for a amplifier system, but it doesn't have any line outputs. It doesn't have any outputs at all. So once we've uh, unboxed it and tested it, uh, we're going to see if we can modify it to give it line out. Also, we live in an area where there's little or no DAB coverage, to be honest. So we want to see if uh, I can improve the reception, maybe fit a, an external uh, antenna socket for it. So uh, let's unbox it, try it out as it is, and then look into the uh, modifications. Now, just uh, taking a quick look at the box here. So we've got 60 presets. Uh, I think that's 30 across FM and DAB. We won't be using the FM side of it at all. It's a complete waste of time in this case. Uh, two separate alarm times, so I can get it to switch on to radio. That might be handy, I suppose. And two parallel timers. Not quite sure why. Uh, 230 centimeters of, I guess, cable on the mains adapter. Doesn't really say. Night dimmer. I imagine that dims the display. We'll find out. Oh, that's a little bit silly. PLL digital tuning. Well, yes, phase lock loop digital tuning uh, for the FM side. I mean, to be honest, you wouldn't do it any other way. Um, not since the uh, 1980s anyway. Uh, and a three-year warranty. Well, it won't have a three-year warranty in a minute because I'm going to take it to pieces. Uh, so, yes, it comes with a built-in LED light. Again, we won't be using it for that because we will not be using the speakers or anything. We want to use it as a tuner. Um, quite importantly, though, it's DAB+. Plus, and that's important because, as I understand it, some transmissions now are DAB+. Plus, so if you have an old DAB radio then it won't pick up some of those channels. Uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons I bought this one, rather than modify an old radio I already have. Uh, any other information here? Suitable for under cupboard mounting or tabletop use. Good. We'll be using it in that man manner. PLL stereo reception. Well, actually, it is good that it says stereo, because one of the fears of mine was it would only have um, a mono output, and then it would have been useless, really, as a... Um, stereo tuner for a hi-fi system. Ah yes, 30 DAB and 30 FM um, presets in brilliant sound quality. Well that would be quite hard to do actually because DAB is not good but DAB plus is better as I understand it. Uh, automatic radio switch off, okay that could be handy. Um, automatic and manual scan, right there's no remote control on this so it's gonna have to be fairly easy to work just on its own uh, buttons two-line uh, dot matrix, um, LCD display, which means, if you drill it out properly, liquid crystal display display. Oh, dear, oh dear. Built-in LED underside of housing. Yes, that's for lighting your cabinet. If you don't have um, lights under your cabinets, can't think why you wouldn't. Automatically synchronizes time and date via RDS. Ah, not via DAB, but RDS. So you do need a good FM reception in order for it to pick up the time and date properly. That's a strange um, decision. 12 or 24 hour time. Dims the display automatically at night. Now, that would be very useful if it was used as a bedside radio sort of thing, which it could be used for, definitely. Accessories, a mounting plate. Well, we won't need that. Uh, it gives it dimensions and a cable. Uh, Right, okay, as I understand it, it comes with a mains adapter, sort of wool wart thing, we'll find out in a minute. Um, comes with a built-in aerial for FM, it says. Hmm, so we'll have to see what the DAB does. Audio output, 2 times 0 0.8 watts. Uh, actually, that is a fair amount. We'll have to see. Um, power backup, two AA batteries, which are included. So that will be for um, backing up your presets. Um... Decoration not included? Decoration? What do they mean? Right, okay, let's um, open it and see what we have. Uh, mountings, I think. Not quite sure how you're supposed to mount it to your kitchen cabinet, but we're not going to be doing that. Uh, the batteries for battery backup. Mitsubishi, so they're not complete rubbish, that's good. Mains adapter, which is a proper UK one. 
and looking at the specifications, 5 volt, 5 watt. So uh, if you had to replace that with another one, you shouldn't have too much trouble and center positive as most things are. So uh, that wouldn't be too difficult to replace if you needed to in the future. Version 05 2021. So this was certainly made this side of May of 2021. We have instructions. Now, I had already looked up some instructions of a very similar model that doesn't have the light, but you can find that online. Not sure if we can get these instructions online at the moment. We'll wade our way through them later. So it comes in two colours, the black and the silver, or whitish colour. I'm hoping we've got the black one, but it wasn't incredibly obvious. This was the last one in the shop, so we'll have to see what we get. Oh good, we have the black one. That's definitely my preference. So I think the idea is here that you can mount this part. Imagine it slides off. Yes. So you can fit that to the kitchen cabinet and then slide that on. Okay, but we won't be using that function, so we'll put this back on. There's a radio aerial antenna there, but it isn't incredibly clear if that's a if it's FM or DAB or both. Well, actually, we'll leave this off because the, the, uh, that covers up the screws which we're going to need for uh, dismantling it later. Let's untangle this. Now, as I said earlier, our dab reception in this area is little to zero, so it'll be lucky if it picks much up, but we'll give it a shot. This is um, a nice cable, actually. Nice, thick cable. That feels like it's decent quality. So far, nothing feels terrible. The unit itself is quite light, but there's no reason for it to be heavy. Okay, I'll switch it on. Okay, so it has a sort of random time and date on there at the moment. Let's switch it on. Scanning. So I imagine that would be scanning for DAB signals initially. Good luck with that. I'm off to the side here and I am say that the um, display still looks reasonably clear. I quite like the display, not bad at all. No dab station. <laughs> There's a surprise. Let's see if we can um, just start up FM for a moment. FM. I'm just guessing at the moment, because I haven't read instructions yet, how to uh, tune it in. Oh, it's having a hard time of it. Okay, so that's BBC Radio 4. So the speakers are underneath. So let's try this uh, light. Okay, that's the uh, under cabinet light thing. So tuning seems quite good. You just sort of turn it and then it will carry on in that direction. Okay, needless to say, Sound quality is best described as um, basic. But our big problem being at the moment, we don't have any dab at all. Let's um, see if we can uh, try that again. Dab. No dab station. That's quite poor because um, even my car stereo makes some attempt at picking up some channels uh, on dab, even though it's uh, an incredibly poor signal here. There's one or two stations it can just about muster. So that's a bit worrying. So I now have part of the aerial sticking out the window, trying again with dab. Oh, nothing at all. That's a bit worrying. There's a manual tuning option for dab radio. So apparently you press and hold the menu button, then rotate this control to manual, and then hit enter, and then you can look at the signal strength for each of the channels. So the first channel is 5A, press the enter button, but this display is a bit confusing. I guess it goes further to the right if there's a signal, but why is it starting not fully on the left? I don't know. I don't quite understand that uh, readout. But we're not getting any signal at all, so I'm going to have to experiment with an aerial. Right, I'm going to have to investigate uh, whether the um, 
there's a separate FM uh, input and whether there might be another DAB input separately. So I need to take it apart. So I've removed four screws from the bottom, one from the battery hatch, and these two screws from the top, which are smaller, and I'm going to see if I can take it apart. Ah, more screws here. So what do we have inside? Two small speakers. Good magnets on them, but the, the actual cones are tiny. That's the light. This is our FM antenna. One big board at the front there. There's a flexi cable which must go through to the display, I'm guessing. Let's um, take a closer look at this uh, main PCB if we can. I might undo these two screws so we can get a better view of it. Right, got a pretty good view of the board now. We can look at this under the microscope. So starting here on the left hand side, there is the uh, back of the control, the snooze button, enter and snooze control. We'll work our way along. First I see, which is uh, marked there and that cable is one speaker cable. Next set of wires along go to the light you can just about see that. This black wire here is the antenna but it's not clear if it's FM or DAB as well. And if you can read upside down, you'll see that uh, there's a USB connection there. So what it'll be is that's a USB connection to this module, which will almost certainly be the DAB radio tuner. There are some markings for those pads, but they're not incredibly clear. But one thing's for certain, we should have line outputs from that somewhere. We'll come back to that later. That's the feed off to the display. I'm not sure if that includes the, um, a processor or if it's just a display. Moving along, that's the other speaker. Oh no, there's the battery terminals. The other speaker's one further along again. So those 8002 chips, the one on the other side as well, they're the audio output amplifiers. And along in the corner here is, not sure, possibly a regulator. So coming back to this, this is the interesting part. This is the DAP tuner for sure. This is the um, antenna wire. And what is clear is that that antenna is serving the DAB radio. It may or may not have a separate FM tuner or it might be built onto the same board. But uh, and I think it is probably built into the same board. So what we've learned from that is it's not an integral DAB uh, antenna built into this unit. It is all down to this bit of dangly wire coming out the back. That being the case, I just need to uh, do some more experiments with trying to uh, get some uh, signal into this thing. So what I've decided to do is desolder the original uh, piece of wire antenna and I've fitted a small F connector uh, piece of cable with an F connector on the end into which I can plug in a different aerial and this is better because it isn't just the single wire but it has the uh, screening on the outside and that means you can provide um, a proper dipole you can have the ground and signal now I'm no great expert on aerial technology but I believe this is going to work a lot better it'll allow me to use a proper uh, dab aerial uh, but initially I'm going to try the house uh, TV aerial now we haven't tried this in years we don't use terrestrial TV 
but I believe it still works. There is an amplifier on the end of it which may or may not cover the DAB frequencies and the aerial itself may or may not cover DAB frequencies terribly well but it's likely to be better than this is bit of wire. So that's all hooked up now. Uh, let's uh, power it up and see if we uh, get any reception at all. Okay, so it's got a random time on there. Let's uh, switch it on and see if we can find an FM channel, uh, a DAB channel. Now we have something. We have a radio list. Oh, that's much better. Right, so that tells us it's a really good modification. I'm really pleased with that. So I'm going to uh, fit this F connector to the back of the radio. We'll just go through some of the um, menu info button options on here. So it's got a radio station on there. And if I, every time I press this, it gives you a bit of information. So that's the signal level. So what I think it's saying is, until you've got the first four squares lit up, you don't have a, a usable signal. And in this case, the signal is wandering around right on the very edge of being usable. Press it again from there. It'll tell you the um, music type or channel type. That's the frequency. And I think it's the cluster it's on. I don't remember the proper naming for that. And the error count, and that's much too high. It's just started, the weather's not great here, and, and I think if when the weather's brighter, I think we probably get a, a lower error count on there. And that's the um, transmission type and bit rate, extremely low bit rate. So this is DAB+. Plus. This channel wouldn't exist at all on a radio without DAB+. Plus. And then you go back to the time which it's picked up, and date. Okay, that's all fine. So uh, I need to fit this aerial socket properly. I'll run a bit of coax through to the front. And then we can look at uh, this modification we need to do. Now to get audio out, I'm trying to avoid the volume control making any difference. So if I can, I'll pick up line out. Uh, I can get some line levels from the PCB and put line connectors at the back. But if that's not possible because of the way it's integrated, if the volume control affects uh, the signal way back at the um, DAX then what I'll have to do is find a way to disable the speakers and take a, a signal from the feed to the amplifiers or the output from the amplifiers uh, to line sockets at the back. Then we'll just set the volume to some sensible level and feed that to the amplifier. But my preference would be to uh, avoid the volume control completely. Right, I've made a small adjustment. Rather than using F connectors, just for the time being, I'm using just an aerial connector. I had a, an extension cable, so I've cut that in half, got rid of half of it, and wired the female side through to the PCB, and secured it by putting it underneath the PCB, so if it gets tugged slightly, it shouldn't um, rip itself off the board. And the signal level is just as bad as it was before, or maybe just a tiny bit better, but that's probably by chance. So now that's in place, we can concentrate on trying to find the uh, line level audio output somewhere in here, probably feeding the amplifiers. Don't know, that's what we're going to have to try and find. Okay, what I've found is that these uh, pads here that are labeled LL and RR, they're the left, left and right signals coming out of this um, receiver unit, although they're set, those signals are set on some DC level, but that's not important. But the, the thing that is important is that those levels uh, go up and down with volume. So I turn the volume up and I get more signal. So that's no good, because that means then that the uh, embedded controller inside the receiver here is uh, requesting the audio level from this board uh, and so there probably is no point on that board 
that I can get to the level before it's um, gone through the volume control. So I'll have to instead come up with a system that disconnects the speakers and takes the output drive to the speakers, maybe via resistors or something, to line output sockets at the back. The feed to the speakers on the, this radio is a push-pull circuit from the two driver chips. So I'll show you what signal we get on the uh, output to the speakers. Okay, this particular signal is very weak, but I don't care. So looking at one side of a speaker driver, and that's the other side. So you can see it's sat on... Turn it down. It's sat on two and a half volts. So that's not surprising, right? You need to provide push-pull and you've got five volt rails. So each uh, quiescent state, each terminal of the speaker is at two and a half volts. And then one goes up as the other goes down. So they're not referenced to ground. So I will have to provide, if I'm going to use that as a line out, I'll have to use a DC block and I can just use one of the outputs. So I'll use say the positive one and a DC block and a resistor divider so that I get about the right amplitude. Now if we look at the oscilloscope here, I'm going to put it now onto uh, AC mode so that we get rid of that DC component. Now I can turn the volume up. Or rolled between the unmade bed sheets. It's watercolour garden, shy thatched cottage and rim of gilt were gone. She spent half an hour looking, increasingly spooked. For what hummed in her right hand was the feeling that she had put it somewhere inside the phone. So you see that we're getting uh, somewhat over one volt, uh, sorry, somewhat over two volts peak to peak um, on that speaker terminal. So if I divide that down by around about 50%, uh, um, then I should have roughly the right output level for line level and I can use the volume control to fine tweak it. So that's my plan. I'll um, scribble out the circuit for you. Right, let me tell me what my plan is for adding line out to this. Now, as it stands, the output from this module is volume controlled, unfortunately. Now, we don't know if it achieves that by having a voltage controlled amplifier after the DAC, or whether it achieves it by having just a DAC and lowering the, the amount of data, if you like, the height of the data that's going into it. Now, if you did it the data way by sort of digitally controlling the volume prior to the DAC, that would be simpler, but it would be lower quality because at low volumes, you're using less of the uh, bits on the DAC. That would be undesirable, and I don't know if they've done that or not. So I want to design a circuit where I get something around about the line level output in the order of one volt peak to peak, when the volume control is set reasonably high, so that uh, there's not too much chance of, of not using enough bits on the DAC to get good quality that you'd notice on a hi-fi system. But I don't want it so high that there's any risk of these amplifier chips, there's one there, one there, of those clipping. Another uh, thing I want to achieve is that I don't want to disable the ability to use speakers should we want to. Now, what I've proven with the oscilloscope just now is we have these chips, and I'm going to just draw one channel here. We have the chips, and they have uh, a plus and minus output, but the minus is not connected to ground because it's a push-pull output. So whilst one signal is referenced two and a half volts, let's say there's two and a half volts, move it out of the way, while one side is going up, the other one is going down, and so you get double the peak-to-peak -peak voltage, and that's how we manage to achieve uh, 800 milliwatts on only a 5 volt supply. Now, our difficulty being that to have a line out, line out is reference to earth or to, to ground, to a chassis point, a single, a single ground point. 
So we're going to have to just use one of these. Now, the, the circuit as it stands at the moment is just this straight to the 4 ohm speaker. I want to add line out and I want roughly half, I believe, the voltage swing that we're seeing because we were seeing around about 2 volts, maybe a little over 2 volts at very high volume. So I want to take this signal and attenuate it. And the way I'm going to achieve that is, well, firstly, not to use this at all. I'm going to take the plus, it doesn't matter which one I use, but I'm going to use a plus, and ground. So we've got the, the system ground here. And the ground there. So I'm going to uh, add two resistors. And I think if I make the resistors the same value as each other, then that'll give us a 50% attenuation that I think is about right. I could fine tweak them later, but I'm aiming for around about, I think, 1 volt peak to peak, with the volume set fairly high for the reasons I've discussed. So that would give us our output. If I select these to say 100 ohms, I'll have a low impedance source. The amplifier on the output of this will be high impedance. But that's not all there is to it, because we're sat on 2.5 volts. So I need to block the DC component before it goes out to the amplifier. And I can add a capacitor for that. The value of the capacitor is not really critical. 0 0.1 microfarads would probably do it. But the roll-off at low frequency is a function of the capacitance and also the um, impedance of the input of the amplifier which I can't predict because it will vary from one amplifier to another. So I feel like adding a really high value capacitor in there to get the best possible base response to make sure we don't roll off anything um, higher than 20 hertz. Now, ideally, I'd like to use something like 4.7 microfarad, but that would typically be an electrolytic capacitor. I don't want to use electrolytic capacitors. They're not ideal for audio applications like this. Passing audio through it is not a good thing. Don't want to do that. Be really nice if we could find a great big 4.7 microfarad um, capacitor of good quality that I could drop into this circuit that is not electrolytic. A bit like this. So look at these. I've got two of these, of course. I need one for each channel. These are dated 1982 and 1985. Uh, but there's plenty of space in the cabinet to take these huge whopping DC blocking capacitors. I know they are complete and utter overkill. And if you're ever doing this, 0.1 microfarad will probably work just fine. But that's what I have, and that's what I'm going to use. That's not quite the circuit over and done with, though. Because whilst we're using a line out here, I need to disconnect the speakers. But what I don't want to do is... Well, there's a risk. If I simply disconnect the speakers permanently, for one thing, it could upset the operating conditions of the amplifier, and it would also make it impossible to ever use it again just on its own internal speakers. So I was thinking, OK, I'll add a switch here, and I can switch the speakers off. But I'm not happy that in the open circuit situation, there would be no impedance at all, it'd be open circuit here, that might screw things up. So I was thinking what I'll do is instead of a single switch, I'll use a double pole switch, and this pole will go via a resistor to the other terminal of the speaker. And what value resistor? It doesn't need to be 4 ohms, I've got some handy 10 ohm resistors here, I'm sure that'll be fine. So I'm going to use some 10 ohm resistors and then have this as a changeover switch. So, because this is one channel, I need to replicate this for the other channel as well. I need a double pole, double throw switch to act as a speaker uh, off switch. And then when the speaker is in the on position, the speaker is connected, and in the off position, it's uh, dumped via a 10 ohm resistor. Right, that's the circuit. Uh, I hope that's going to work. If I have to tweak the value of these resistors slightly to get the line level out, I'll do that. But apart from that, it should be uh, 
pretty straightforward, I think. For the switch, I want a double pole, double throw switch, uh, and I found this. This looks like it's uh, got a, I think it's a Phillips part number on that, but uh, whatever it was originally designed for doesn't matter to me. Okay, a little fiddly to mount, but I will find a way to mount that so that you can switch the speakers off. Right, that's pretty much completed, but I wanted to show you a few changes. For one thing, my original diagram, well, there was a mistake. I had the 4.7 microfarad capacitor um, on the output circuit, but I prefer on the input to the attenuator. So let's do that again. So then my attenuator, which is 50% attenuator, I'm now using 180 ohm resistors because that's just what I happen to have to hand some suitable ones. Then this is ground. So this is the output here between ground and halfway. Now this is for me, I was using trying to get something to feed an amplifier, this little line signal. But if you wanted to do the same sort of thing, uh, but you wanted headphones, instead you wanted to fit a headphone socket to this, you'd do the same thing except I would probably recommend you did away with the attenuator and went straight to this point here for headphones. Uh, but what normally happens when you insert a headphone jack into a piece of equipment is it disconnects the speakers. But it's not really practical to do that because the normal headphone socket you have jack plug, then you have here, this is the tip, and a ring and an insulator, and the sleeve. And this is ground, and this is right, and this is left. Now, that assumes we have a common point for the two channels, which we don't. So even if you use a headphone socket with switches very often you'll find that you can get uh, headphone sockets will have a switch on at least these two terminals if not all three terminals but there's not really any way that i can see here that you could have a an arrangement where you have the three switches uh, and you can disconnect the speakers successfully with no risk because there's a hazard if you came up with some sort of design and you could probably think of something where you uh, had the two sp speaker isolation switches here so here's a jack plug as I've drawn there this is a quarter inch jack socket and as you plug it in it isolates these three terminals here as these three terminals are connected. But um, I can't see a way of allowing the speaker connection through here, say at this point, to be broken with a jack plug. And then how would you arrange for the 4.7 microfarad capacitor to be applied to the headphones to stop any DC on the headphones. It's not really practical. So what you'd have to do for the headphone circuit is fit the switch in the same way as I've done here. So this switch we can look at here and I've arranged it so that in is mute. I will actually print, I'll uh, use my label printer later to print a label for this that will say speaker mute when that is in, and they're the 10 ohm dummy load resistors. Here's our left and right outputs for going to an amplifier, and I have checked where the board actually says, we looked at the board next to the receiver module, it actually is marked left and right, it's LL and RR on two pads there, and I've checked that they are the pads that go to the amplifiers associated with the left and right because it's a pet hate of mine getting the speakers back to front so uh, I, I've done that the correct way, way round got a K 
cable relief there for the aerial socket so I've just fitted this coaxial aerial socket I think everything else is ready to go just before we reassemble this I did want to talk briefly about the sort of system on a chip design they have here so the information I managed to find on the IC and the entire module here is a little bit vague because I think the only people who are supposed to get full circuit diagram information for this are the manufacturers, customers of the, the module, not people like us who are just interested in the project. So they don't give us the pinout, for example. But what we do have here is a system on a chip and um, a EEPROM. And what's going on, we don't have uh, a controller, microcontroller chip associated with this display or anywhere else on the board. This is acting as the only microcontroller and that's got the customer's code in it, their, their firmware. The chip in there, it says that it has inputs for rotary encoders, so these feed that directly. In fact, these chips can do a lot more. They can drive color displays and show images of things like, I don't know, album covers and stuff, I believe, when it's playing music. But obviously this just has a simple two-line display. So it's a very, very minimal cost design they have here because there's no external to this microcontroller. All they have is that one microcontroller and then the board contains just these rotary encoders, LCD, buttons, a little bit of power handling and these small amplifier chips and precious little else. So I was thinking, what do you reckon this costs to build? Should we have a sort of a quick guess? I'm going to cost. I'm going to cost the parts as I see it. I may be completely wrong, but I reckon this is quite an expensive part. There's a lot in there. It's got the AM and FM. Sorry, the FM and DAB um, receiver and the firmware, custom firmware and crystal and everything all into that the analog and digital do you know one of the expensive parts of a part like this is testing that's going to be a very difficult component to test that mix signal product so i'm going to guess that that system on a chip that whole module costs the manufacturer of the radio about five pound then what else well, we have a few other ancillary components on here, like the power input socket, battery hatch. The speakers are probably relatively expensive. They're only they're very small cones. They're not terrible speakers. And the LED and wiring and bits and pieces. So with the case as well, the actual cabinet, I'm going to say there's another £2 worth in the case and ancillary parts and speakers. So what about the PCB? There's a fair bit on the PCB. Um, okay, you know, these are nothing terribly sophisticated, but we've got amplifiers, regulator, quite a few capacitors. We've got the LCD itself. That's going to cost a little bit. may not be a custom LCD, but even so, it's going to be uh, a few bob. So let's say that this PCB and its components and the LCD, I'm going to say that that costs... Four pound. My guess. Then what else do we have? Well, there's the box and instructions and packaging and batteries because it comes with a couple of um, batteries as well. Uh, so I'm going to say all that little lot probably cost about another two pound. And then there's the mains adapter, which is a generic one. 5 volt 1 amp so it's a fairly high power one um, I would have thought that's going to cost a certain amount because it's a, you know, it's, it's a reasonably powerful one I'm going to say as much as £2 it might be a little less actually but let's say that that's £2 so total cost uh, not talking about the cost of you know the, the development and the firmware and stuff like that but let's just look at the cost of the uh, manufacturing uh, of the, the product. So I'm saying that that comes to around about 
£15 total, and it sells for about £25. So between the manufacturer and Lidl, they're making, I would guess, around about £10 on it. But of course there's distribution and other costs in there as well. There's going to be returns. That's not all profit, plus the original design costs. So that's not all profit, but that I think is a margin. It sounds about right to me. And I would say that this is actually a really well um, thought out design. I think they've done a great job of getting the costs down without making a complete ass up of the quality. For example, if you notice they've, uh, okay, I, I've messed it up a lot of it, but they've secured the cables a lot to make sure they don't rattle. They've used speakers, which despite their very low, uh, small size, really aren't bad. Uh, the push-pull output gives you a decent amount of power. Uh, I, I think probably they've pulled it off pretty well, actually. I, I'd say that for, for £25, they've achieved quite a lot. It would have been nice if they'd provided a proper antenna input so you could connect it to a proper antenna. You know, it's not just that we live in an area where there's very poor DAB. There's lots of people live in areas where DAB reception is extremely poor. This simple wire antenna that they'd provided doesn't really allow you to add a better antenna, which is a major failing given that uh, there's great swathes of the country where that in an indoor setting simply won't give you any reception. So a, a proper aerial socket would have been a major bonus and of course I think line out is extremely useful but other people might prefer a headphone socket and if they provided a headphone socket they'd have achieved much the same thing. They could have possibly fitted a headphone socket somewhere in here. You never know they might do an updated version which does have a headphone socket because the previous version of this didn't have this light. Okay, let's uh, reassemble it, and uh, it's then ready to go. So that was the uh, Silvercrest DAB Plus kitchen radio, which we modified to have line out. Now, there was something I was worried about here, is that because it actually sounds quite rich from those quite small speakers, that it might have had a digital bass boost. And had that been the case, then when connected to an amplifier, it would have had an overpowering bass, which would have made it sound terrible. But I connected this up at my dad's place, where it turns out he's got really good dab uh, reception. Just a little wire antenna actually was all we needed. And the sound quality from this into the amplifier is top notch. Really excellent results. We're delighted with it. So this is a black version. They do a silver version as well. Oh, hello, Mrs. Video 99. Why have I found this in the little shopping bag? Ah, uh, well, I bought another one. Okay, so this is the silver version. Uh, this was the last one in the shop, so the, I think this is the extra display one. It's been out of the box already, you can tell. The wrapping is not all there, but um, the unit itself looks fine. Yeah, it's very small cosmetic marks. Unfortunately, little being the sort of shop they are, they don't give you any um, extra display sort of discount. But uh, all we need anyway is the unit itself. Oh, it has all the fittings anyway. Oh, look, they're white on this one, where they were black on the other one. That's for mounting it onto a kitchen cabinet. And we have the mains adapter, which has clearly never been used, and the batteries. So uh, I can feel a, another modification coming along. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning a little bit about these um, Silvercrest DAB radios. Uh, I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now. <laughs>